Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins, and welcome to Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the podcast. Um, every week I'll be discussing a theme regarding the pitfalls of the music industry in a section that's called Justin Hawkins Rides Again, the jaws of victory, pitfalls of the music trade. Um, that's what I'll be doing. Anyway, this week we wrestle with the idea of whether artists, musicians and celebrities succeed more if they are considered relatable or aspirational. Does it even matter or should it even matter? Um, we also try and figure out where I fit on that scale. So please let me know what you think about all of this in the comments so we can resolve it once and for all. I'm dying to know, am I relatable or am I aspirational? Or neither. Am I just some bloke in a City Slickers t-shirt? saying some waffle words into a camera. Who knows? I mean, you guys know. Let me know. Let me know, so I know. Um, anyway, next week I'll be interviewing the inspirational artist, Ren. And some of you know who that is already. Um, and if you don't, you definitely need to watch that episode. Uh, but in the meantime, please, to enjoy. Again. Good day to you one and all. It is I, Justin Hawkins. Of Justin Harkins rides again. <laughs> no, you, now you say your name. <laughs> oh, oh, and Jenny Mayfin. <laughs> 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 and this is Justin Hawkins rides again. The jaws of victory, pitfalls of the music trade. Semicolon. Aspirational versus unrelatable. Aspirational versus unrelatable. Justin Hawkins rides again. Again. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> Keep. So, explain. What's the context of this uh, episode? It's how um, it's probably not about staying relevant, but it's about people's perception of celebrities, people like you online. Like some people would see you as a role model. Yeah. Or aspiration. Well, I can understand that. Yeah. But are you supposed to be relatable or are you supposed to seem aspirational? Well, has something happened recently that prompted this? Oh, yeah, it was Jennifer Lopez did like a TikTok with Vanity Fair. Right. And the guy was like, so who would play you in a movie? And she was like, they haven't even been born yet. And he's like, hmm. And she's just walking around her kitchen, like <laughs> drinking coffee and stuff, but all glammed up. Yeah, okay. Like. Jennifer Lopez never looks dishevelled. So dishevelled. everyone got annoyed with her because she's too... Perfect. Perfect. And mainta like showing off, maintaining the celebrity vibe. Because before celebrities walked around like, I'm a celebrity. But yeah. now it's not cool to do that anymore, is it? Mm. Yeah, but it comes and goes, doesn't it? Yeah. I always used to say this about being in a band. Like, um, I think in the 90s... I mean, after all the sort of the heady 80s when everyone had mansions and helipads and stuff like that, in the 90s, uh, that was completely rejected, uh, as was virtuoso guitar playing. And then Oasis, I think Oasis was like the, the very peak of the boy next door array. You know, they were like um, blokes in anoraks with... Um, from normal parts of the world with... Lad culture. Oh, yeah, it was lads, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like lad culture, wasn't it? It was not like a specific type of time where it's like... There was a different... Yeah, so it wasn't just the boy next door. It was actually the boy who was, who was in the pub, the annoying guy in the pub. Yeah. The noisy, gobshite guy in the pub. Yeah, I guess that's relatable. That's yeah, really relatable, and it's really easy to achieve as well. Like, even if you're like um, a posh lad, you can pretend to be... You know, that kind a of... A lad. Well, they a are lad, posh yeah. lads are still lads. They just have a stupid accent. And yeah, but you can hide that, though. Well, what I'm saying is it's, it was more to be able to sort of... There were role models in the sense that it was really easy to sort of um, simulate their aesthetic. Oh, I remember that fact I wrote for you. What was the fact? More guitars were sold during... Great Britannia era because of Oasis oh, yeah. and ever before. Do you mean cool Britannia? Cool <laughs> Britannia, <laughs> Great Britannia. I don't know. I'm not English. <laughs> well, you're from the it. British Isles, though. No, I'm never gonna say that. Well, you are though. No, just one part of it stuck to it. 
<laughs> this is getting political. We don't call it British Isles. Well, you don't call it, it British Isles. It calls it the Isles. common travel zone <laughs> area. Yeah, that's what it's used to say on maps, isn't it? <laughs> the common travel, the common travel zone area. area. It was handy during COVID. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. Um, okay, so I think what I'm saying is that it's one of those things that fluctuates. You know, like um, like fashion, I suppose. It's sort of sometimes it's cool to be Jennifer Lopez in your kitchen with all of your um, you know your mink coat on, your Pomeranian dog that's perfectly pruned. I'm assuming she's got one of those. I don't know why I'm saying that. Really, she looks like one, but like in a good hey, way. In a good not, way. Please, I'm not saying that she looks like a Pomeranian. I'm saying that she, she might have nice a, hair. Yeah, okay, and so everything's perfectly <laughs> coiffured, including the dog. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and she's got, like, um, Dubaia pots and pans that she's never touched. Somebody else is cooking for her. Um, she's drinking a coffee that's probably been made by the barista that lives in her house in the special sort of barista wing of the mansion. This is like when you started talking about James Hetfield's life. <laughs> Just getting so specific. Well, yeah, but again, he's from that era when it was okay to be like that. But he crossed many decades. Yeah, and I'm sure that he's witnessed the fluctuation that I'm talking about. And he's definitely not relatable, is he? He's aspirational, right? I think he's becoming more relatable with every sort of mental health issue that he speaks yeah. openly about. He's becoming like the everyman, isn't he? But is a role model someone that you can relate to or someone that you wish you could be? Isn't it? Isn't a role model somebody who demonstrates qualities that you would like your children to uh, well, isn't exhibit? It you know, someone that you want to have the qualities of. I used to think that David Beckham was a good role model because he was so like um, he worked hard. I used to think that, and obviously. Now it's quite clear that <laughs> <laughs> he's just like a, a guy that would do literally anything for money. I think that's what that is, you know. Yeah, I just saw him as a footballer <clears throat> with funny hair and high-pitched voice. How has he gone from, like, the guy that queued up for 12 hours to look at a, a, a dead queen in a box to the guy, the guy that goes to <laughs> Qatar and takes a load of money and then ups, uh, alienates the gay culture, uh, the gay community that he was basically the poster boy for, wasn't he? So he was trying to be relatable with the queen thing. Right. And then uh, the guitar thing's aspiration, aspirational, right? That's not relatable. No, no people get asked to be given loads of money to just stand. How, how much money was it? Was that actually disclosed or what? I doubt it was disclosed. Somebody said 10 million. Minimum, right? <coughs> He's not going to do anything for less than 10 million. Well, how much did he get for standing in that queue for 12 hours? You see, that's cultural capital. It's a different kind of Ooh, capital. You mean like, um, so it's the kind of currency that... The Court of Public Opinion awards you when you do something noble and... Yeah, it's a different kind of capital. I never even heard that phrase. Say it again. Cultural capital. Cultural capital. Thank you, education, <laughs> from when I went to cl college. So cultural one capital. Thing. So that's a little bit like... Um, but it doesn't mean anything. Like cultural capital, you can't spend it on anything because as soon as you go to Qatar and take £10 million to go and um, turn your back on the gay yeah. community that's championed you because you appeared on the front of Attitude magazine and you were the first footballer to actually do that, then you, then you go to Qatar for £10 million and the cultural capital is completely wiped out. Or maybe it's like a net zero thing. So maybe he knew it was coming up. Thought he'd plant a few trees like they do, like yeah. airplanes do. And then he'd go over there and now he's just kind of neutral again. Yeah. Now that <laughs> now that the orchard that he planted has been razed to the ground. <laughs> yeah. And it's just ashes and uh, apple cores. Yeah. But yeah. the Beckhams aren't relatable, are they? They're very aspirational. Like Victoria Beckham's very... Yeah, but I always thought he was relatable and she wasn't. I don't know. I, I guess, yeah, I guess he's And the difference is he was a footballer, so he comes from lad culture by definition. You know, there's people shouting at men. <laughs> you know, that's what football is, isn't it? Yeah. And then, um, in a, well, I mean, I'm obviously being reductive. Men's right? football's like that. Men's football is, yes, sorry. Yeah, men's football is some men shouting at some other men. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and then like, uh, but she was in the Spice Girls. Yeah, so, so she was in a very girl culture. But she was posh Spice, so it's like she decided to be what her character was. It's and like she was only labelled posh Spice by... Chris Evans, the radio DJ, wasn't she? I thought they all had their special... Yeah, but it was him that, that gave them those names. When he was like... Um, He's a bit lazy with Ginger Spice. Um, 
I think all of them are pretty. But like that's just her hair color. It's just not a personality trait. Yeah, but I think with, with the. It's like you being it, white man spice. What? <laughs> what would I be? White man spice. What the. F- White man spice <laughs> because it's just <laughs> the new fragrance from Justin Hawkins. <laughs> White man spice. Like if he, it's like Chris Evans just looked at ginger spice, saw ginger hair, and went ginger spice. Well, he's got ginger hair as well. That's not about him. So I don't think he was doing it in a reductive. No, I don't think it was reductive. I think it was lazy. Sorry, Chris Evans, because actually Chris Evans is very nice to me, and he's my <laughs> only fan. Yeah, stop talking to Chris Evans. He's not listening to this. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chris Evans anyway, but. <laughs> hey, I think he said it as a in solidarity, really, because he's also got ginger hair and he knows what that that means, you know, and what uh, culturally what that means and what it means to grow up with ginger hair. And the bullying started with him mm. in the media, didn't it? What do you mean? He started he started the bullying. Or no, he, he he was the victim of the the onslaught of bullying against redhead. But he did a cool thing that was kind of like that was really the there was a a moment when he realised that he was becoming so aspirational that he was unrelatable so he capped the amount of money that he, he was prepared to make for himself and everything else that he made after that point he gave to charity unfortunately the figure that he capped out was something like 79 million <laughs> million pounds well at least he had a figure yeah but you know you can imagine there's, there's a hell of a lot more after that that he actually ended up giving away yeah that's pretty, that's pretty good. but still I think if you've got 78 million, you're driving Ferraris and living in the best houses on the market. Yeah, and yet you still don't really associate Chris Evans with that, do you? I'd still think he's got a relatable face, isn't he? His whole attitude is relatable, yeah. But And also, he, he, was, um, he was championing... Oh, by like the way, it's not Chris Evans, that Hollywood actor. Oh, oh, yeah, we should say that, shouldn't we? There are two Chris Evanses that are um, um, of note. Um, those, of, those of you who live in the British Isles will... And the know, Common Travel Zone. And the Common Travel Zone um, area. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chris Evans that we're talking about is the um, flame-haired broadcasting legend from the 90s and noughties. And, and he's probably back beyond. again now doing his show on Virgin Radio. <laughs> Sorry, okay, so like he, I'm plugging Chris Evans. Okay, well, he's a radio DJ and he was a TV... Uh, presenter as well wasn't yeah. he and he had a lot of sort of tv formats that were really successful in the 90s that championed things like ocean color scene the music band from oh. birmingham i um, didn't know they were english yeah they are and um uh what was the other one? long pigs as well when he had his radio when he was doing the breakfast show yeah. he kept playing she said the long pigs long pigs song like a, a year or so after it had been released and then turned it into a hit and uh, made the long pigs a, a, a more viable. Do you think radio DJ should have more control over what becomes a hit rather than what some people are designing playlists? This is a side tangent. Okay, I think that radio DJs often do have more power. They've got they've got they've got little slots in their sets where they're allowed to do that, and they've, they've got like um, an obligation to play stuff that's, that's playlisted. Mm. Um, but I think. There's always room for them to do other stuff. I think it's. I actually think it's the the DJ's responsibility to try and break new stuff. Do you think it, they're not given as much opportunity? I don't know exactly how it works, but um, when you get playlisted on a, all I, I only know it from the band's pers- perspective, really. But when you get when you get playlisted, then you're assured of a certain number of spins in a week. And I'm yeah. not sure exactly how many it is. It probably depends from station to station, obviously. But um, so you'd imagine that if all these bands have been promised a certain number of spins, there's only going to be so many opportunities to play other music yeah. available to the DJs themselves. But there's definitely gaps, and they can definitely champion things that they're excited about or play oldies that they love. And yeah, there's that Future Sounds one on Radio 1, which is actually probably the best slot on Radio 1, because it's non, not really ever pop music. You mean BBC Radio One? Yeah. What's the other did you get that in Ireland? No. Don't you? What do you have instead? RT One. Anyway, let's get back to the topic. Right, so you're not very yes for uh, relatable, are you? What? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> you were on up Look there. Look at me. There's, I've got wood Wait, chip on the walls. Let me explain. The, let me explain. The spleen. <laughs> let me explain. All right, let's have a little explanation. <laughs> you're up there in a cat suit. All right. 
You're not a dude in your t-shirt and jeans. No. You're out there pumping it up in a cat suit or with a, a very unachievable vocal range <laughs> and physique. Yeah, well, I'm just doing my job, ma'am. Yeah, but that's what I mean. So are you going out there trying to be relatable or are you going out there trying to be incredible and like aspirational? Well, this was the whole thing about, this is what I was going to say. When I was growing up, like in the 80s, Mm. It was um, like the rock star wasn't the guy next door. It wasn't the guy shouting in the pub. You know, it wasn't the guy wearing a tracksuit and talking about, you know, <laughs> whatever blur you used to talk about. I don't know. Um, Coffee. You know, pigeons Pitties. and p greyhound racing or whatever it is. Um, it was the guy with the helicopter and the big car in the stupidly huge mansion at the top of the hill with the high walls completely and utterly untouchable loads of mythology around them they live in castles almost and um that was what that was what being a rock star meant it was like you, it was a totally different lifestyle to the one i mean it's escapism almost it's, i don't even know if it's a, the same thing as what we're talking about like we, we were talking about um uh, relatable versus aspirational yeah. and the aspirational thing I think you have to have a glimpse of what that lifestyle is to be able to aspire to it. Yeah. But my understanding of being a rock star when I was a kid was like, who fucking knows what they're doing? They're probably nuts, but they're probably surrounded by luxury. You'd see like pictures of the stones, like when they're in Villefranche, you know, in, in the south of France. That's what I mean, you get a glimpse. You do get, yeah, that's what I mean. But it's, that's what I mean as well, I think. But I suppose I'm saying that there was a mythology around being a, a rock star in the olden days and it was and it had to be a mythology because nobody really knew what they were up to you still had like salacious scandals and stuff that would pop out wouldn't you only when they left the house well yeah you don't want to know what they're doing in the house necessarily no so I think that the likelihood of seeing Mick Jagger walking around with his Pomeranian and his barista uh, and his mink coat on no knickers well, I don't know what people see um, Robert Plant walking around though in his town yeah but he's not he's not the same animal anymore is he? he's a folk guy now yeah so he's walking his but sometimes you do see a celebrity out in the wild yeah and then what happens photos <laughs> yeah <laughs> photos yeah Ed Sheeran was talking about that on the podcast with Peter Crouch and what was he saying he was saying he, now, he didn't mind before but now that he's a father he can't be a pop star and a dad at exactly the same moment in time he finds that like that disjunct difficult like if he's in the park with his kid and he needs to attend to his baby and someone's shouting at cheering at him wanting a photo he's like can you give me a moment to be a dad I can't do both at the same time he says he finds that really difficult and a bit annoying and most he says most people are respectful but teenagers aren't so respectful because if he was in the park and his kid <coughs> was cycling around everyone's being respectful but then the kid on the bike's went around the whole park screaming Ed Sheeran's over there on that bench <laughs> yeah <laughs> he's like not happy about that so he finds that difficult. I had a thing once when I was in uh, with my ex we were sitting on a at a table in a restaurant and then this guy this is years ago this is back in well, it must have been 2004 or something like that and we were, we were having lunch at a table outside the, the what was it called the the Grove or something like that. It's a posh hotel, like a golfing hotel or something like that in Watford. I don't know, why are you in Watford? I don't know why we're there. I think, we, I think we're launching a, a perfume or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what we're doing there. But, but anyway, we went there, you know, just to have a bite. And, um, and then this guy came over. He was a bit drunk and then he just sat down with us and started talking to us and knew who we were. And was like basically um, he'd read that we weren't together anymore and was basically trying it on with her while I was just sitting there with my pint. <laughs> That's <laughs> weird. Yeah, it was weird. And it, and it's all because of the complete lack of mystique. You know, like I think if I if I looked over in a beer garden and I saw like, um, let's say for argument's sake, Stephen Tyler sitting there. Imagine, like yep. a, I see that and I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to go over there. He's, I don't know anything about this guy, but uh, I admire his music. Maybe I'll just sort of stare at him for a bit and then just leave him alone. But because some details, salacious details about my personal relationship with the person that I was sitting with was out there in, in the 
public eye. He thought he knew both us and the situation and thought he could just come in and do what he liked. Maybe he's just <coughs> not... Because most people, even if they know salacious details, won't go near someone. Like, I wouldn't. Like, the people know about Steven Tyler stuff. Like what stuff? Like, his struggle with drugs and stuff. And <laughs> You don't know anything about Steven Tyler. That, what, that, what, what, that, those details are out there, though. What I don't details? Know. What I, drugs? I don't know the specific... Name the drugs! No, but you know what I mean. There's, people know, to an extent, some things that have happened to him. doesn't mean you can go up. Like when the, the story broke that he'd relapsed recently because of his foot injury. Hmm. I wouldn't then go up to him and be like, how's your foot? <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> some people have a natural respect <laughs> for people. Some people don't, I think. And, like, um, and then he'd get up and he'd feel obliged to limp because he's cancelled some shows. But like, some people have, don't have respect for personal space and people's privacy, I think. And some people do. Right. But then some people do like develop that relatability maybe too much and then it can be a downfall yeah because but i think this is what i think like if there's too much information around about an artist or a person in the public eye that's damaging in that in the, on that level because people assume that that but just because something's common knowledge they assume that it's legally obtained information that they're entitled to know and it informs whether or not they are comfy walking up to a stranger who happens to be in the public eye and making those kinds of, you know, but remarks. Like, what, what if you recognise someone because, of their, because they're a really famous artist? We don't know anything about them. Would you not... That type of person might still want to go up to them and be like, hey... I like, like your art. Yeah, or you know, I fancy you. Or they just, you know, say something weird. I don't know. I mean, that that gives arms them if there's pieces of information out there, but doesn't necessarily deter that type of person. I don't think, does it? No, I think that type of person that you're talking about is a different animal altogether. But I think, in general, the culture states it's okay to go up to people and ask for pictures. <laughs> you know? Yeah, it but that's be been like around for a long time. That's been around forever. But now phones are more readily available. Like if you look at footage of the Beatle mania fans. Mm. They're like tearing each other apart trying to get at that's the Beatles. That's how it should be, yeah. But if they had phones, <laughs> they would have been running up with their phones. They wouldn't have gone, oh no, I don't want a photo with them. They just yeah. didn't have fo- cameras. <laughs> it was a better time. Yeah. You like Mystique. Yeah, I like Mystique, but uh, you're saying that um, Mystique is now, we're at a point where Mystique is so unfashionable that it's considered unrelatable. But do you think people can like fake relatability? That's the thing. You know, it's like giving people a sense. Do you think that's what I do? Yeah, I think you're good at it in in general. Hey, you give me some, give me some examples of why I'm not relatable. Like, then no, I was talking about as a rock star. Like you're not like the, maybe that's why they call some people rock stars and some people singer songwriters. Well, no, singer-songwriters is a person that stands over an acoustic guitar singing songs that they've just written. Yeah, but isn't that all people? They've just written the songs and they're playing them. No, but I and mean... singing them. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you flash between <laughs> <laughs> you, You'd have all the power over there. Yeah, but a singer-songwriter... Okay, so the thing is, a singer-songwriter in a leather jacket could be a rock star. Why? Because I think rock star is an implied level of aspirational this. Like, for example, if I'm wearing a shirt for a broadcast like this, it's probably going to be made out of fake leather, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas most people would just have a simple cotton shirt. And why did I choose the fake leather? Because you want to be aspirational. No, that's not why. Rockstar. And rock stars are aspirational. Y- yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I prefer a rock star to be more... But I don't know. What I mean, okay... So those rock stars that sell their souls to the devil, they, um, I mean, how can you, how can you actually, like, for example, um, you know, you know, all the sort of iconography of the crow, for, you know, that movie, yeah. and then all those bands that were doing like, like him and all that stuff, just doing the crow, mm-hmm. basically just doing the crow. Mm-hmm. Um, that started off as a fantasy well, it became a trope, but it started off as a fantasy movie, really. I mean, I know it's probably a horror or what, what do you call that? A drama, a supernatural drama of some sort. It's a horror, isn't it? Yeah, thriller. 
horror thriller supernatural drama. Is that what it is? I guess so. Okay, but anyway, it's fantasy. It's mm. definitely firmly in the realms of, you know... And, there was th- and I think because of the fact that Brandon Lee died when it was being made, it had a lot more... carried a lot more weight. But really, it's just the, it's the styling of that that's just completely informed the aesthetic of a lot of that sort of 90s, noughties, you know, that particular kind of glam mm. and metal and goth and all that stuff. It was all, it's the crow. Him are doing the crow. But what's that got to do with aspiration? <clears throat> I'm wondering if the bands that do that were relatable, they wouldn't look like that. It wouldn't be as cool. No. What they're aspiring to is the crow. They want to be, they want people to have so much revered mystique around them that they're just sort of, oh, these could be guys that have been dug up or they're back from the dead. And the less you know about their lives, the more justified you are in making your skin pale, putting the black makeup on, wearing the leather trench coat. But also they're a blank canvas that you can imprint whatever personality fits your mould as well. What is? If there's more mystique, then there's a more oh, there's yeah. like a canvas that you can place what traits you wish you think that person has. Mm, so you can be anything you like. Yeah, that character can be potentially be the perfect character for you. But as soon as they come off stage, they're not going down the supermarché wearing the makeup in their eyes, are they? Unless they're from Norway, which I've seen a lot actually. There's a lot of those sort of panda metal guys with the, you know. The ones that burn down each other's houses and stuff. They've got they actually walk around like that in Norway. It's it really is an authentic way of life up there. In a certain part of it. Yeah. Um, it's like a uniform. Yeah. But it's sort of it's daily f- fashion wear as well. But I think a lot of the bands that I'm talking about don't dress like that when they're when they're not on stage. And there's obviously exceptions to that. It's how do, how do you achieve relatable how would I do it then? How would I think I, you're good at it. I think that your stage persona is aspirational and your off-stage persona is relatable. Okay. Um, Which is maybe a good mix. But then it goes against your weird on-stage, off-stage persona intertwining. Or maybe I do. It. Like, if I dress in funny stuff, I can't really walk around the village that I live in. But would you want to walk around in your katsus? Well, I don't really want to walk around full stop. I'm so unrelatable that I would much rather have somebody else do the walking around for me I don't want to go to the post office I don't want to go to the supermarket it's not just laziness it's like a sense of entitlement I, I want to spend my time being creative I feel like my job is writing songs but everyone has jobs and they still have to do stuff no but when I mean job I mean it in a wider sense than that, so that's like an ego thing we were talking about the other day sense of entitlement yeah I think it is yeah I do. And I think people who do what I do need it to maintain the momentum and to just keep doing stuff that's fulfilling. You know, do you think it would make your uh, you behaviour towards people abrasive? I don't think being nice costs anything. I can always do that. I'm probably too nice. But sometimes it, if you think you shouldn't be doing anything other than music can inhibit just being a person sometimes? Well, just being a person. Like some people be so entitled that, because if I asked you to make me a coffee or something. I made you a coffee just now. That's what I mean. But some people would be like, I can't believe you just, you know, asked me to do that. Or that's not my job to be doing things like that. I stirred it. I no, mean, no, I'm not saying that you wouldn't be like that. And I then just, I drank it by accident. Oh yeah, he did drink it. <laughs> yeah, but the, in principle, I did intend for it to, to be yours, you know. But you need to maybe you can maybe feel like you shouldn't be doing all the boring stuff, like going to the shop and that's well, people are, if, who are excelling in all in whatever it is they're doing, yeah. the CEOs of whatever companies or just high achievers do have people doing that other stuff because they don't believe they should be doing it because it's a waste of their energy. Like Mr. Beast, who does a YouTube channel, is like, I shouldn't be doing anything other than being on camera because hmm. that's my job and that's what makes the money. He's like, I shouldn't even be deciding what edits are happening or like talking about equipment or anything. I should own, he's like 90% of my time, there should always be a camera on me all the time. That's his thing. Yeah, okay. Well, I sort of 
wish that it was that I could have the same way of life because all, everything I do requires me to be creative. And some days when I don't have help, I um, have to choose between cooking something for myself or maybe writing a song or doing something that's actually sort of music related. I think this is where people would find that unrelatable because they'd be yeah. like, I do not have the time. I like that's what about all the people who are cre creative but mm. then have to do that stuff mm. and have kids and yeah, have I know, raise but their kids mm, and do all that kind of what thing. You what you actually aspire to now, I think the one thing you can that you you know the last bastion of uh, um, unrelatability that you should really be able to aspire to is being able to live a creative existence the whole thing about being a musician is like you what, what you feel like you've made it when you start being able to call it your living you know what I mean like it's your your actual profession when your hobby becomes yep. your career but then to maintain it, you, you you really need to focus on it and do... St well, I can cook for myself. Because I'm busy doing this stuff all the time. You're doing a great job. But you know what I mean? But people wouldn't look at me and be like, I, you're the type of person who needs someone to cook for you. Because mm. you're just a normal person. Well, a lot of people in your actual family don't even believe that this is a real job. Well, most people probably don't believe it's a real job. <laughs> <laughs> It is a real job. It's a real job. But peop maybe people need to be told, understand that that is relatable. Mm. Maybe because the people who you know might be like, you're risking being unrelatable by saying that. Why is it a risk though? Because What's wrong with it? That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. Maybe people shouldn't find that unrelatable or arrogant or anything. It's just maybe because it's so out of reach for people to even comprehend that they could have that level of convenience. Yeah, but that's the whole point. Okay, the whole point of dedicating your whole life to doing something that's creative and unusual and in an industry that's notoriously difficult to break into. That's the the risk is you might fail, but the reward is you're doing something that you never thought possible and you, you're living a lifestyle that did seem completely unattainable when you first started off and most people were put off by that most people create a, fa a safety net you know they'll, they'll go and get some sort of qualification that isn't to do with the music trade something that they can fall back on and you know go and do a normal job with what do you think the um why do you think people get so angry about it like when the james hetfield video they're like he should be taken out his trash why are they so do they, what do they say? They, he, that he should? He should be. It's like, <laughs> I'm what? the opposite. Yeah, but then why do you think they feel like... The, it seems to be like a trigger point, like a weird s sore spot for people if someone feels they're above taking out their trash and that they should be doing that. It's like a weird... I'm not saying he should or shouldn't. Everyone surely would want someone else to take their bins out. I hate taking my bins out too. I always forget. You know what? <laughs> you know who <laughs> likes taking the bins out? You do. This guy. I actually like it. And but you I'm like not. Doing your laundry as well. I do. Yeah, I actually enjoy laundry. I don't know what it is about laundry. I just I like doing you it. Like clothes. I do like clothes, and I like sort of. I think part of the joy of clothes for me is maintaining them and washing them. <laughs> Sounds weird, but I actually do. I enjoy that. Yeah. You but know. but why do you think people think? Why does it get annoying and if they? The think other thing is, I enjoy doing other people's laundry. What's that about? Um, nurturing. Maybe it's your nurturing side. Oh yeah. my god. Yeah, because you, you do mine sometimes. Yeah, I do. I don't sniff any of it when I'm washing it. I just do. What I'm trying to get is why do people find that so annoying? It seems to be a comment that people... It's like a divisive comment. Hmm. Why? Working class hero is something to be. That's what I mean. Like, what is it? Why, are people, why, why does it hit its horse spot for people? Is it... it a terrible thing to say is jealousy because you never want to say to someone that they're jealous. Oh, I wasn't even. I wasn't going to say jealousy. No, but sometimes that would be the next leap. Logically, is like you are annoyed that that person doesn't have to do the thing that you have to do mm. because out of necessity and they have convenience and privilege. Mm. But why do you think James Hetfield should be taking out his bins? Well, I don't think he should be taken out. I mean, no, but I'm trying to. F I'm asking why. Why does that annoy people so much? I, I think. In, look, let's get back to the James Hetfield. I know we we're always talking about James Hetfield. <laughs> <but laughs> so he's saying, 
when he comes off to he he sits there stroking his cats and he takes and taking he his, it taking out his garbage and that's not doing it for him because it's not as much of a thrill ride as yeah. being on stage we talked about that at length yeah <laughs> but um so if he's listing taking out the garbage as something that, that that is an indicator that there's a disparity between the two different sides of his existence stop taking the fucking bins out get someone else to do it yeah. but why does <laughs> i'm asking why it annoys viewers and people and fans that's what I'm asking you. Why do people get so annoyed by it? Well, don't you think that, like, if... <laughs> what would happen if um, Jennifer Lopez did an, a, a, an at-home piece? She was living in a terraced house in Cardiff. <laughs> <laughs> I think people would quite like this, actually. I know, they would love it, wouldn't they? It'd be amazing. Like, she answers the door in a, in a, um, a knock-off juicy couture oh. velour tracksuit. That's going very far. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she, that's how she answers the door. She says, come in, lads. Puts, puts a fag out and, uh, and they're like, Whoa. <clears throat> yeah, I'll crack a window, don't worry, lads. And then, and, and then uh, she says, you want a cup of tea? And it's, and it's full-on PG tips. She makes it herself. Um, the dog... <laughs> isn't a Pomeranian it's a Jack Russell and it's just shit in the corner so she's like I'll just get rid of this turd and then and, and then does all that and it would clearly be performative relatability yep. there's no way any of that would be real it would be funniest but it wouldn't be real um so what's the solution then somewhere in somewhere in the middle <laughs> maybe not the mink coat but also not the dog shit in the corner yeah it's like people are it really does Great, like they were saying underneath the Jennifer Lopez TikTok from B Vanity Fair, was it? Or was it the other one? Vogue? One of those ones. Oh, she's so out of touch. Mm. It's like, well, she could be in touch, but again, if you can afford... We all know she has loads of money. What's she going to do with it? Mm. I don't know. I mean, she was, she was J-Lo, wasn't she? But yeah, it's just... I'm just... It's annoying me that people... Well, it's not annoying me, but it's just that thing that people... If you went to someone... If you went on a YouTube channel, I don't got someone to do that take out the bins mm. I think a lot of people would be like oh he's so arrogant out of touch he can't even bring out his own bins I guarantee you someone would write that mm -hmm. why? well it's never going to happen to me because I because I do <laughs> as we've stated before actually enjoy the bin I do I enjoy bins and laundry um but if I so you're saying that if I said no but I'm I just said, asking why do you think it grates yeah. on people not that you should or shouldn't be doing. Okay, it. let me. I'm just trying to think if it grates on me because I, I would never take my own. It's something. No, sorry. <laughs> you be J Lo. Okay. Hi, J Lo. Nice to have you on uh, Justin Hawkins rides again. Yeah. Uh, Jaws of victory, pitfalls of the music trade, uh, the J Lo special. Uh, well, tell me, what does a normal day entail for you? Well, I've got everyone to take care of everything in my life, so I just have to wake up. Then there's a coffee by my bed. Mm. Then I put loads of stuff in the bin and someone takes it out for me. All right, I don't waste my time doing such a menial task. JLo, if I may interject at this point, what is it that you're putting in your bin? Uh, apple cores. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I don't wear the same... But don't you, I don't don't you, don't you have a compost heap? Hey, I don't you wear the same pants twice. Well, that's not bin. You don't throw them away, do you? I put them in a the bin. Uh, that's not good for the planet. Can't you send them down to the uh, for the local orphans or whatever? Or are you worried they're going to sniff them? That's a good point. I don't think they want pants like that. Anyway, someone's taking my bins out. I don't even know what's in them. Because someone... I leave stuff around and I don't even pick it up. Someone puts it in there. J-Lo, I don't think it's going to have apple cores in it. I reckon <laughs> you've got a compost heap at the bottom of your garden. Have you ever noticed like a big no, pile of rotting vegetables? Know. Why would I know it's at the bottom of the garden? Don't you go in That's your own garden? garden? Do you no, have somebody who's going to your own garden I've for I've got you? a gardener who looks after my compost heap. <laughs> Takes my apple cores out. Are these euphemisms? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you you're getting hung up on that? What everything that's in the house again? I'm trying to get All down right. to the core of relatability. Okay, J Lo has definitely got a compost heap somewhere in in What's the property. The, why are you talking about the compost? Well, she's not going to put apple okay, cores in the bin, is she? We've yeah, got a planet to let's save say, here. Okay, you're there. You go. Oh, I don't know where you know what. Ask me then. Ask me about my regular. Let's see no, if I'm okay, relatable. No. But okay, well, we're just going to skip by the fact that the, my, someone underneath your comment section is going to go. He's so arrogant; he can't even take his own bins or anything. But I don't everyone. take my own. I'm talking about hypothetical. You, why are you getting hung up on this? 
Because it the, the bins. Right, I can't on. believe James Hetfield doesn't take a bin there. Don't say, well, he shouldn't be taking his own bin. Well, he shouldn't. I'm asking why that person's so angry. He right doesn't it. like the, taking the bin. Oh, I see. Why that per- Yeah, got it. That's what Different I'm question. To... All right, all right. That's the same question. Okay, so, James Hetfield, why is it why so it upsetting annoy- to a certain Steve? type of person? Why is Steve being so annoyed about the fact that James Steve, yeah. hate doesn't okay, like Okay, so Steve, things. let's call him Steve. You, Steve Utrecht. So <laughs> <laughs> just places in Europe. Right? Steve Utrecht has written a comment saying, "Fucking hell, this uh, Metallica bloke has all gone to his head a little bit and too big for his boots. Can't even take his own bins out. That's not very relatable. Yeah. That's the comment, right? So we're trying to explain why that rubs people up the wrong way. Yes, finally. Oh, can't expect me to understand things. You've only been going for 47 minutes. <laughs> so, okay, so why is it annoying? Why is it annoying? What is it about that? Yeah, because let's say someone... It would, like, burst the bubble of you're like me or something. Right. It but, just annoys people, doesn't but, it? Is it because J-Lo has danced with that concept when she did that maid in Manhattan? I didn't see the movie, but I saw a picture from it, and it seemed to be her wearing a French maid's yeah. outfit, which I assumed to mean that she was either a Parisian sex worker, or an actual French maid, or a maid. And I'd imagine it's probably like um, one of these um, aspirational love stories where she's like a housekeeper or something. An ordinary, an ordinary housekeeper who happens to be played by the delectable <laughs> and irresistible <laughs> Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> Falls in love with presumably the person that's appointed her. I don't know. After a compl- I would imagine there's there's friction at the beginning of their relationship because she starts. I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen the movie, but I'd imagine she uses the wrong polish on the on the Eames, been, Eames chair. I've been. I've had issues like that too. As in, I was the J Lo in this situation, but not in a sexy way. Mm-hmm. And I was um, told off for doing things wrong. Because I didn't understand that. Okay, so she's she might knock a valuable vase off the shelf when she's dusting. Oh no! What do I do? And she glues it all together. Calamity ensues. Um, Where are we going? And then the, then she falls in love yeah. with the the rich man. And now oh, now I'm rich! Yay! Yeah. Okay. I don't have to wear this pinny anymore. Yeah. That's what that film probably is. If yeah. I had to guess, I mean, is it that? Why are we talking about this? Film? Because that's <laughs> aspirational in itself. Yeah. yeah. But the, the whole thing is like the happy ending is. You don't have to be, like yeah. in Pretty Woman, you don't have to be a sex worker anymore. In Made in Manhattan, you don't have to be a maid anymore because you married the rich man and then Do you, you think get that's taken out of, away. that's not as prevalent anymore? Well, I don't think it can be if you're getting upset about bin taking out. <laughs> you know? now, the, now the story would... Now, the, the way to make that a happy ending would be um, the man who she's working for, and it will be a man... Because it's a trope, right? Yeah, it comes down to her level. Yeah, exactly. So he loses his job um, and uh, ends up looking for some help, domestic work, you know, domestic help work. Um, and they start a little business together and they downscale and they live in a terraced house in Cardiff and run a cleaning company for the... For the um, they do schools yeah, and... Because and that's the more British relatable. Hall. Yeah. So that's in fashion now. Right. But she doesn't. She doesn't come from a period of time when when yeah. that was the case. Fashion, you know, the fashion was to be glitzy and yeah. Because like bands now are on TikTok and they're like lying in their bed or they're strolling around. Yeah. Those videos. But they used to be sort of literally laying on piles of money and stuff and like driving nice cars. And I think some artists still do that. I think that there was a J Lo edition uh, Fiat Five Hundred though once. Do you remember that? Oh. It was, but it was convertible. Probably had oh. some fancy bits on it and stuff. I think. That yeah, it was, or was it Fergie from the Black Eyed Peas? But do you think when you're a celebrity, you need to maintain a level of celebrity in, in order for people to take you seriously in whatever role it is that you're playing, so that you need to continue to look successful in order to then be given up more the same opportunities? Like if you fall from grace, per se, it's yeah, not good. Yeah, I mean, I think if you've been in a situation where it's necessary to have a blacked out car taking you to stuff and getting rushed into buildings cause, just because of the inconvenience of having to deal with the throng, you know. Um, which, I mean, for us, it, that happened momentarily. You know, it was like that for a second. 
But then it wasn't like that. And then you can't justify, pay, you know, paying for chauffeurs and stuff if you're not making that sort of money. You don't, you just don't, you just go in taxis or you go on the tube. I go on the tube a lot, actually. I'm always on the tube. Because first of all, it gets you across London quicker. Second of all, it's way cheaper. Third of all, no one gives a fuck if it's me on the tube. They don't, they don't care. Nobody cares. It's brilliant. So sometimes people come up to you still. Yeah, but it's, it's always about the YouTube channel. It's a different type of... It's not as an... Is it's it not like you're some, more as relatable now? Well, yeah, and also I think that the reason why people are recognising me is something that's more like... Um, it's not something that they've had to pay for. So it doesn't... It's not like they've invested in me. They're just watching stuff. That's most content now, their music's the same. I suppose that's true as well. But I think if you're like um, an ardent Metallica enthusiast, you've probably paid, or you feel like you've paid some portion of um, James Hetfield's mansion. You, there's a sense of investment that's different. I don't know. I don't think I'd feel like I uh, own the artist I've well, supported. Well, I'll give you an example from my own career, if you like. I had some issues with addiction. And I remember in the early days of things like Facebook, I had certain fans saying stuff like, oh, there's no way I'm ever going to buy another record if he just spends it on that drugs. Oh. Yeah, people have a weird thing about it. Yeah, there's a sense of ownership. And I think this, like, when, you, when you're creating a product, like in the olden days, the days when J-Lo was selling records and Metallica was making albums and that people actually bought, then the, the fan base of these artists have a, have a sense of investment in their lives and the things that they spend their money on. And they feel as though they've contributed to the comfort that those people are experiencing. Yep. And it's different, isn't it? It's not like... So when I see... So like this, this happened to me on, on my way up to Scotland the other day. I was in Terminal 5, just in the normal queue. I wasn't being ushered through or anything. And I was standing in a queue and somebody who was in the queue facing the... Because it was one of those snaking queues. It was, yeah. it was Heathrow, which is f by the way. Um, he was coming up to me and um, he said... I really like your channel. Cheers, mate. Like that. And really it was like really, that? yeah, I loved it because it was so, well, it was like, a, it was just like a little pat on the back. It was no, nothing intense about it. it. didn't ask for a picture. Do you think that because this sort of stuff is more relatable and less aspirational, people feel that you're just a normal guy and they're not like treating you with that sort of reverence that they might, people who have more mystique and then they might want a photo or freak out, you know. Because of the nature of the content. Yeah, and the kind of relatability of it. I say low-key. What are you talking about? Sometimes we do stuff with, like, CGI hamsters <laughs> and all sorts. <laughs> we've done but you know what I mean? Like, people are like, you're so, I like watching it because it just feels like it's ten minutes a day. Oh, yeah. Chatting. And some people would feel like it's just an intimate chat. So when they see you, they're probably like, oh, hey. Like, they see you every day. Yeah. But well, isn't that, that thing that you talk about, which is a parasocial relationship of some sort? Mm -hmm. Explain that. Where you have a, a relationship with someone, but it's ve it's purely one-sided. So you start developing feelings and attachments and opinions about that person and investing in, you're invested in them as a person and could start feeling a variety of emotions towards them, but they know nothing about you at mm. all. It's a parasocial relationship. Yeah, enough about my sex life. <laughs> No? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Fine. That's what it is, though. <laughs> yeah, I think we've I think we've cracked it. I think it's because Hetfield comes from an era when people were felt like they were actually putting their money into his pockets. A good example is Hancock on "I'm a Celebrity, Get You Out of Here." What is the this? Tories put him in? Matt Hancock, the health secretary. So it helped actually put him in I'm a celebrity because they wanted him to be more relatable as a normal person. Mm. So people would then feel this parasocial attachment to him, which worked briefly, I think. People were like, look, oh, she kind of like him. For, and then because the Tories are so, I know there's politicians, but politicians are a type of celebrity now anyway. Yeah. Um, they're so, people felt such a disjunct between the Tories and their own life. But then they put Hancock in a jungle and people suddenly felt like, oh, he's just like everyone else. And it worked. But you couldn't, you couldn't have done that have in the you, past. But have like, you ever met like an aspiring politician? 
like a, a young person that, that aspires to be a politician. I feel like I did, but I can't remember who it is. But I feel like... I, I, I did. I met some... Because oh, um, the stepson of my guitar teacher wanted to be a um, politician. I don't know whether he ended up becoming a politician. But I always thought it was such a... He was intelligent, you know, he was a smart person. And I thought, I used to think at the time, like, why would a smart person want to do that? I always think that politicians are never our best people. But I know. think they start off, a lot of them start off with, with, good with, with sort of ideologies and... They want to make the world better. Yeah. And they, they, you need people who have... Do you, think that, um, do you think Matt Hancock wants to make the world better? But then there's the type of politician where they're, they're s- where they go to school and they're trained to be politicians, like Eaton and all that. Yeah. They're all just trained to be Is politicians. Is that where Matt Hancock came from? Probably, yeah. I don't know. Does he strike you as a person that wants to make the world better? No. Does he strike you as somebody who wants 400 grand and a, and a good deal of forgiveness for the mistakes he made during COVID? Yeah. Right. But I think it did start to work because he was looking kind of affable and goofy and flawed in a very, like... Only if you way. watch it. Yeah, but a lot <laughs> yeah. of people watch. Only one, if you watch it, that's one of the, the biggest like, shows. Though, what about? Uh, I think the only thing that people should watch is his performance as a politician. That's that's what they should watch. But the Tories were smart in that way. But they put him on one of the biggest shows on TV. It wasn't just the Man- Matt Hancock show. Mm. I don't watch it because it's. Do you think it would make me more r- relatable if I watched things like that? No, I don't. think... What would it make me do? Become angry? Yeah, I don't think the people that uh, watch your channel necessarily watch that. Mm. That's why YouTube is and the internet's good. Because yeah. you can find your niche and only consume that. I know that sounds echo chambery, but you can find multiple niches of varying degrees. Mm. I didn't expect to be talking about Matt Hancock Sorry. on this. <laughs> but politi- no, don't apologize. It's like it's a re- we're talking about relatability in public figures, but mostly in music really, I would hope. What was that thing with um James Corden that you said about? Was that for a different episode? Yeah. Right, that was just that. him getting angry at waiting stuff. Mm. So that's a sense of entitlement too. Mm. I don't know, that people do say the out of touch thing. I don't know, but then there's that woman on um, TikTok who was like, my hot water is broken and I'm going to check into it. the Savoy. Uh, oh. uh, because uh, I'm, I've, my hot water is not working. And everyone was like, this is not the time to be saying because your hot water is broken, you're checking into a five-star hotel in London to have a bath. But her page prior to that was people followed her because she did show a luxurious type of lifestyle that most people couldn't attain, and they enjoyed watching her lifestyle. Yeah, that's like. But then when she when she made it a bit too, when she then compared it to their actual real life, go, mm. it made them feel weird. It's like you ha- if you do the escapism. So it's when it's when when you lift the veil, the aspirational veil, and then you realise that everything inside is also shiny. Because the Jennifer Lopez thing is a bit rich after sort of lauding her as J Lo and the and the one who came from whatever you know whatever her upbringing was and to become this sort of self made millionaire you know against all of the odds you know I mean I suppose she was because she was was she poor when she grew up or just well, she was Jenny from the block yeah because she went from being Jenny from the block to J Lo. And that was the whole thing. It's like, look, I've made mm-hmm. I've made myself into this. Yeah. And now it's like, and everyone was like, yes, J-Lo, if you can do it, that means I can do it too. And then now it's like, well, you shouldn't be showing off about being able to do that stuff. It's not, I mean, it's just, that's what it is, isn't it? Maybe it's, it's to do with the cultural time of the cost of living crisis and stuff. Oh, yeah. So maybe that's out of touch now. But then people still do. It'd be it. really funny if it was like a mid-interview, like all the lights go off. Oh, fuck, I'll put a bit of another 50p in the meters. Sorry, lads. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor J-Lo. But yeah, the out of touch thing, where they love, people seem to like celebrities who are relatable, I guess. I don't know. It's a, it's like a weird, it's a very fickle thing, I think. I think if you try and curate it too much, people can see through it. Like you said. Like if she was in a cottage in Cardiff in a tracksuit, people wouldn't believe it. Yeah, there's some things I do that I think make me relatable. Yeah, I think I Um, said throughout the whole episode, I think you are very relatable. Yeah, and I I said your onstage persona is aspirational. That's that's your theory. Yeah, I think um, I think my onstage persona is quite relatable in the truest sense because I 
I actually do kind of um, interact with the audience in a really personal way, don't I? It's like I often single people out and I'll share things about my own life. And, and do if you I share say, things about your life on stage? Yeah, I often do, yeah. I often do. My, mostly my sex life, I suppose. But, you know, in a, what I hope is a funny way, I suppose, you know thing is i i do i will interact in the sense that like i'm not unapproachable am i i mean no you know i think you've got an interesting persona oh do expound i think it's difficult to f- f- know what you really like <laughs> it's hard to get a read on me is it yeah if you it depends what type of person you are and how you read people like some how people, i read people no like some people will try will just read the on on stage persona, and some people are always intrigued to know if that's the real person's personality, yeah. and then some people are interested in where the line is. I had a phone call with Ricky Gervais once years ago, and um, he said uh, that he just imagined me sitting in my house wearing my cat suit. Yeah, a lot of people say that they're like, "Why are you wearing?" I would have never have been like, "Oh yeah, he wears a cat suit." You know. Oh, I remember one thing you said once in mm. an interview about mm-hmm. your sex life. Oh yeah. They asked you something about, I think, your sex life or something. Right. <laughs> and you said, "Yeah, I like to do role play with my <laughs> wife and wear cat suits in bed. She loves it." <laughs> yeah, she was well pissed off when I said that. As well. <laughs> it was but like, like yeah. it would be, it's a funny image. Yeah, and I only people said would be, almost believe because they're like, "Well, yeah, he's that's the sexy cat suit," you know. Yeah. Quite difficult to get at the key area, though. I think you know, in terms of you have to, you know what I mean. Like it, to to actually get out of one of those things, it's probably not. And also, yeah, you can't, I mean, can't you really do it in a sexy way, really. It's well, you, you do it on stage where you flip it down. Like that. Sometimes I do that. Yeah, That's it's true. more of a drag off a situation, isn't it? Surely it's almost easier in a way than jeans. Uh, yeah, there's less buttons and zips and things that can cause <laughs> discomfort. <laughs> or just awkward pausing. Yeah. I think sometimes, like, whenever you're in a sensual situation and there's a garment involved, there's a certain amount of, right, man, how do I, uh, how do, I do this now? Um, it's like I that, think it's it? either slow and steady or aggressively tug. Why are we talking about <laughs> this stuff exactly? Because you said you talk about your sex life on stage. And then I mentioned the interview where you say you wear cat suits. Yeah, and, which I got into trouble for, it. actually. It was the first nail mm-hmm. of many in the coffin of our love. But it's funny. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's what I thought as well. <laughs> that was my argument. If actually. I was wife, I'd be like, that's hilarious. I know, I know. But um, the person that w- was actually my wife... Did not share your sense of humour. It would have been almost funny if you said you wear like you don't take your clothes off because you're so strict. And <laughs> yeah, like a shower in my cat suit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be out of character at any point, even when I'm bathing. Yeah. So you know, if I go to the uh, local uh, Lido, I'm wearing like a swimming costume that has an open front like that. And you have basically one, don't you? I do. Yeah, <laughs> I, do. Yeah. I do have one of those. <laughs> and the funny thing is, on the back, it's got. Um, <laughs> this is how relatable I am. It, my swimming costume is a cat suit with short legs, um, and on the back, yeah. <laughs> Has a, a huge embroidered um, illustration of me as King Neptune. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I was joking. I'm actually not. So, but that's what people would want from you, in a way. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I can't really. I can't go down to the local Lido without wearing my Neptune cat suit, can I? I mean, it's what would the they'd think I've lost the plot if I turned up in like you know your, your generic European bathing thong? They'd think I was. A lunatic, yeah. wouldn't they? Yeah, all of your tattoos sort of act as a costume too, don't they? Well, yeah, I suppose in a way, yeah. It's part of my vibe, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Relatable, see? So I think I've passed the test. But maybe it is relatable. Maybe it's the type of rock star they would be if they were a rock star. Well, that's interesting. So what do, what do you think, like when today if you start if you pick up the guitar for the first time and you think right i'm gonna be a rock star what kind of rock star do you think the youth of today aspires to be sam fender yeah that's the working man Lewis basically Capaldi. right oh these are relatable people aren't they lewis is so successful because they consider him so relatable but actually he's 
almost so not relatable because he's so funny. Yeah. If people think they're as funny as Louis Capaldi, they're wrong. Yes, I agree, yeah. So he's relatable. Sam Fender is relatable because he's a proper lad. He's like an oasis type person, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, he or is, Bruce but without... Yeah, but he's got the... Str- yeah, he's the Springsteen... String bean, you are going to say. I was going to say string bean because <laughs> that's how much of a prick I am. Someone Even got it, offended by you calling him string Yeah, bean. well, that's kind of... But it's a string bean. I just like it because when you're referring to him euphemistically, you can call him Spruce String Bean and then you can tell any story you like. And, but what you're talking about is the generic sort of blue-collar working man's relatable rock star. I, I went for a jog along... Uh, we were playing in um, Asbury Lanes, uh, New Jersey, which I think is String Bean County, if I'm not mm-hmm. mistaken. Um, I went for a, a long run. It was 20 kilometres. I was quite pleased with the time that I put in. What, because I <laughs> ran for a long so time? Because you're so athletic. It's oh. impressive. Well, I went for a long run. Let's just not talk, okay. Let's talk about. But what I was going to say was, I went past um, what looked like an armor-plated Pope mobile, pimped-up Ro- Rolls. Uh, it wasn't a Rolls Royce. It was. Well, it's a Range Rover, like something a really fancy version of a Range Rover. Maybe it was like a, you know, a Lamborghini four x four or something like that. I don't know. And I thought that's probably Bruce Springsteen's car. But then I thought, why would he go down to like? Asbury Lanes and walk along the promenade. You always think, always wonder what you. They never, not like go for walks, rock stars, are they? In your mind. Well, I think that going for a walk is relatable, but I think they drive to the place that they're walking from in a really fancy car. Yeah, that's unrelatable. Yeah, I guess so. The car aspect. Yeah, but then if you've sold a gazillion records, why wouldn't you drive a? Why why, why wouldn't you spend an? Because pro- maybe you don't want to draw attention, and also your car is more likely to get like. Vandalised, right? I must admit, I was tempted to do something to it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was a little. But bit. relatable should be the just the human experience, isn't it? Don't people get go oh boo hoo when like a famous person's a bit sad? Yeah, it's like that's them being relatable. They're sad, but then they're not allowed yeah. to be sad because they got money. Yeah, because yeah. it's the privilege, isn't it? It's the yeah. If you're in a position of privilege, then you're not allowed to express anything other than gratitude, I suppose. Yeah, and joy. Uh, your privilege. Yeah. But that's not what the human experience is, is it? Um, the human experience is suffering. Yeah. Well, this is what I always say about happiness. It's, uh, every day should be a spectrum of emotions. You should experience all of them. And then you sit with the pain, you celebrate the pleasures, and you have all the fun, and you suffer like everybody else, just in different ways. I think that poor that poor individual who had to go to the Savoy because the heating had broken down, within her frame of reference, emotionally, that's a really bad day. Yeah, she had <laughs> a bad day. But she probably has bad days where like someone's treating her badly or emotionally doing something to her. Suffering is an emotional thing, isn't it? Yeah. So whatever knocks you off feeling good will be bad, even if it doesn't if it's not relatable. I remember um a rock star that I know really, really well was on a train. Some people were saying mean stuff. He was being relatable because he was on a train, on a train home from London, outside London, right? These people were being pricks, singing this song at him and saying like, uh, uh, you know, uh, laughing. He looks like that bloke from that band that he was, he actually is that bloke from that band, you know? Mm. And then um, to offset the sadness caused by the meanness, he decided to say, well, fuck you guys. I'm going to go for a swim in my pool when I get home. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Watch Coronation Street or whatever, you know. That's like the John Bonamassa thing. Aha, uh-huh, that is. Yeah, yeah. And then people were like, oh, it was a low blow for him to brag about playing in front of loads of people. I was like, well, someone just was really mean to him. He has every right to brag back. Yeah. Why, why does he have to take it? Joe, Joe Bonamassa is a blues legend. It doesn't matter what his hair's doing. Like, if you ever go at his hair, then... But if you have a if you say something mean to someone, and their mean thing back is them just celebrating themselves and not actually picking on you, that's actually like them being taking the higher ground. Yeah. I don't know if it's it was it, it was that Olga. What's his name again? Ola. <laughs> <laughs> it was Olga. It was Ola, the, Ola, the guitar man yeah. from the YouTubes, who said that he didn't react in a classy way. I thought it was sort of classy. That's the, what I would say. I'd be like, that's fine, but 
check I'm doing something so much better that you're coming is irrelevant yeah. to my life. Or just ignore it, I think, was the thing. Yeah, but sometimes you're like, if someone's being mean, they deserve to be taken down a peg or two. Do you remember when I had a go at that guy for the irony? Yeah, actually, you're sort of, yeah, you're not allowed to respond to trolls anymore. I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know that, I know that. But that guy was like a total prick. And he's talking about somebody who I know, who was a friend of mine who died, and then using that as an opportunity to have a go at me. And call him Malt Loaf. Yeah, he was a f***ing prick, so... People liked that. Take I enjoyed comment. dismantling him because he was a he was a twat, and it was like that's that's. But they sometimes like sometimes it's just nice to do it, you know. It's just just a, a little. I suppose it was an intellectual flex, wasn't it? Because it's like kind of like the guy had nothing really, but it's just I shouldn't have weighed it in, but couldn't resist it. But people didn't mind your weight. It's actually your fault. I'll tell you why. <laughs> you curated the comments. Yeah, but I ask you if you if you want a mean comment. And yeah, like, I always say yes. <laughs> but people liked it because because I'm relatable. No, because you didn't brag about your own life. In that you were doing it in a very factual based kind of way. Well, it was just the definition of irony, wasn't it? Which you weren't like screw you. Check, my car is great. What car do you drive, asshole? <sighs> yeah, I could have done that though, couldn't I? Yeah. Anyway, you need to res uh, uh, sorry, conclude about being relatable and aspirational. In conclusion, you think that aspirational is okay when you're on stage, relatable is more favourable when you're off stage. I yeah. think that the trend, the current trend dictates what's acceptable. I think 20 years ago, nobody would have complained about James Hetfield not wanting to take his bins out. I don't think anybody would have complained about J-Lo walking around the kitchen wearing a mink coat with a Pomeranian that's got the same hairstyle as her or whatever it is. Like, like, where's this video? I don't J-Lo. know. Well, I don't, I don't look at these things, do I? I as I said earlier, I think it fluctuates. Sometimes it's acceptable. Sometimes it isn't. In times of international crisis when there's a fucking war on nobody can afford to heat their homes that probably isn't the time to talk about not wanting to take your own bins out or you know the stuff that j-lo allegedly did um but i think in when 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 there isn't a war on and you know in more prosperous climes it's quite all right it's good to aspire to stuff isn't it yeah i mean what's the that's what ambition is isn't it why do people want to relate to them, to these artists? Like, why do they want to feel such a connection to them on a personal level? Is that because of social media and this kind of illusion of... Uh, it's a form of fandom, I think. Because remember, I did that dissertation on fandom. Okay, then. So let's... <laughs> perhaps the way we should run <laughs> to round this up is for you to give us a very short synopsis of your dissertation on fandom. Well, you know, there's different types of fans. There's the fans who just love you and want to come to your shows. Mm -hmm. There's the fans who want like a romantic or sexual in relationship with you. There's mm -hmm. the fans who want to caretake, like Michael Jackson's fans, you know, who they were like protecting him and stuff. Yeah. You know, they're like, we love this person, they don't do anything wrong and we'll, uh, we'll protect them. From like the media or any other sort of critique. BTS fans probably. Those are like the best that. ones actually, aren't they, when you think about it? They're yeah. the ones that ride into battle when, yeah, you're, the when your name has been dragged through the mud. Yeah. They're the ones you want. Then there's the ones who feel like you mentally and emotionally kind of look after them with your music. That's, uh, well, it's my job, you know. Then there's people who want to work with them. What are the hours? <laughs> Not you working for <laughs> <Okay>. them. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> they work for you. I mean, yeah. Or work with them. Mm -hmm. You know the way that people like. Oh, work. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Understood. Yeah, the yeah. way they see. You know the way people like to work with the people who they aspire to be like. I guess because it's good to surround yourself with the people that you want to be. Mm. With similar interests, I guess. Like, be a roadie or something. Oh yeah. Uh, then there's people who want to be friends. I think, have some sort of relationship. <laughs> <laughs> so gone. And then so there's hero worshipping, where it's like an idealization of that person and the put on a pedestal, and they're like the ver like your hero. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a dangerous Makes one sense. too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and there's all those different types of fandoms. Kind of. I can't remember why I said it again. There's a reason. Because we were talking about why you want to relate. To oh it. yeah. 
when people... why, rela- why relatability is important to yeah anybody. because all those sort of versions of fandom exist mm. sports have a very strong sense of fandom of like you said David Beckham earlier mm. but that's a version of they want to be like that can you imagine queuing up for 12 hours to look at a box I mean I love so many people with the box reference only because death is upsetting to me and, and obviously she was my queen just as much as she was yours and everybody else's to whose queen she was she wasn't my queen. Wow. She was. She was a queen. She? she was the queen, wasn't she? She was queen. Since day one. <laughs> Since day one of my life, she was the queen. Yeah. And then she wasn't there. So um, for those of you who are offended by me referring to the coffin as the box, that's just a coping strategy. I didn't queue up all that time, and I don't think I would either. because For anyone's funeral. Well, by the time you get there to the front... You'll be bursting for the toilet. You won't really appreciate the moment. They had t- portaloos around the place. Well, nobody told me there was adequate <laughs> toilet facilities. I would have queued up if I'd known, you know. And people were bringing snacks and stuff. Oh, God, I wish I'd gone now. No, yeah, no, it probably was great. <laughs> when the cameras are there. <coughs> Hi, yeah, it's me, Justin, from the dark. I am relatable. Look, uh, here I am. I'm queuing up with the, with the others. De- De- Be- Beckham, yeah, he's just he's over there. You would like have that. had to do a lot of small talk. It's my speciality. Yeah, you're good at it. So yeah, relatability is important to maintain a fan base at times. Does everyone, anyone ever sort of talk about relatability when it comes to the royal family, though? All the time. <laughs> okay. That's like the main thing they talk about. That's the whole issue with the monarchy and the royals. <laughs> Why doesn't anybody ever bring that one up? <laughs> like, um... They're so relatable. You know how unrelatable I am? I'm not even <laughs> privy to the relatability qu- questions relating to the uh, royal Why family. Why do no one ever talk about how re- unrelatable the monarchy are? I don't even live in the country. I don't know who, what's, what, what everyone's going on about, do I? I so initially, if you want, the monarchy saw themselves as an aspirational thing. Yeah. We show how the best... Yeah, like version. Disney princesses. They, can, yeah. they come from nothing. And then next thing you know, they have princes for, for husbands. And Look at them go. And the monarchy are great as aspiration. As you're born into this... And you can never move out of it. No, you can marry into it, though. That's a very small number, though. It depends how many kids they have. Right? Well, yeah, I mean, it's like winning the lottery, but it's exactly like winning the lottery, actually. Yeah, but their relatability is an issue, isn't it? Well, it's the Queen. That's why they don't walk around in crowns anymore. I really love um, the way Prince Charles used to do that one where he does this like, And, and what do you do? And then they answer and he goes, mm-hmm. <laughs> I couldn't give a shit. That's why Princess Diana was so beloved. Yeah. The people's princess. Because yeah. she was normal. And they loved her. And they hated the monarchy. Well, they didn't hate, they loved the monarchy as well, but they loved her because she's like, she's so relatable and she's she ours. She's so relatable. On those last few cruises with mm-hmm. Dodie and the, the al Fayed family. And also... What was I going to say? Oh, she was very, she. The whole country mourned when she died, and no one knew her personally. That's strange. That's relatability. You're mourning someone you don't know. That you've just seen pictures of wearing a nice dress. And um, I used to go to an Indian restaurant in um, on Holloway Road. Yeah, called the Red photo, Red Rose Tandoori. <laughs> yeah, the biggest thrill for me was when I promoted Red Rose Tandoori. Yeah, you're on the menu still. Yeah, so still got my face on the menu. Um, along s- <laughs> and then pictures on the wall, myself and uh, Diana. Did she really go to Holloway Road? She didn't go to Holloway Road, but I think she was somewhat of a role model or, or some sort of you mm. know she was a heroine to those to those guys. You know, you see that's strange, isn't it? That re- level of re- relatability made her the most loved person in the country and America, partly. Because <clears throat> she's walking around looking all nice. Yeah. With being that, very friendly. Being all nice. And then the and then Meghan Markle, everyone's like, not relatable. So all you gotta do is be nice then, is that it? Being nice is probably the best. Well this is what I've been saying since the beginning of this channel. <laughs> Just be nice. How hard can it be? It makes you more relatable. People are pleased for the aspirations that you have and the ambitions that you show and I so you just gotta be honest and nice. Honest? Well, nice. Ciao!
Sebastian Hawkins rides again. Again. Don't forget to like. Oh, you do it. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the bell and watch one of those two videos. Oh my God, you told me to do that. So let me do it. <laughs> Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications and watch one of these two videos. Nice one. Thanks, Jenny. Bye. So what do you think? Is being relatable or aspirational more important? Tell me in the comments section here. And remember, next week I'll be interviewing Ren and he's an artist that's making waves and touching souls. Touching souls right now. Uh, anyway, yeah. Cheers, guys. See you later.